Before we start today's video, do you guys ever think Counting Crows frontman Adam Duritz looks a lot like Adam Richman from Man Vs. Food? Let me know in the comments section below. Anyways, the San Francisco band Counting Crows would burst onto the scene in 1991. One year later, the band recorded a demo tape that got the attention of nine record labels who were in a frenzy to sign the band. Counting Crows soon signed with Nirvana's label Geffen Records, more specifically their subsidiary DGC. By the later part of 1993, Counting Crows would release their debut record August and Everything After, which would go on to sell a whopping 7 million copies stateside and 10 million copies worldwide. The album was helped due to the success of several big singles, but none were bigger than the lead single Mr. Jones. But you guys may be surprised to learn that Mr. Jones was never supposed to be released as a single, and its success took the band, their label, and management by surprise. Either way, Mr. Jones would become one of the most inescapable songs from the 90s, but who was Mr. Jones and what's the story behind the song. That's what we're going to discuss in today's video. Prior to forming Counting Crows, frontman Adam Duritz played in a variety of bands, including a group named the Himalayans. It was by 1991 Duritz joined forces with guitarist and producer David Bryson, forming Counting Crows, who originally existed as an acoustic duo. They would eventually expand their lineup to a full rock band, and it was shortly after signing to DGC, the band landed a high-profile appearance at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremony in January of 93. It was during this time they were working on their debut record, August and Everything After. After, and they were filling in for no-show inductee Van Morrison. The band landed the gig thanks to Gary Gersh, who worked at Geffen Records and signed the band. Gersh would introduce Counting Crows to the Rock Hall's musical director, and they would appear at the ceremony. Fast forward to September of 93, and the band released their debut record. The group's label and management would take an old school approach when it came to marketing the band on radio. In fact, it was so old fashioned, some claimed it was revolutionary. During the month the album was released, the band's label would issue the record to college, alternative, and modern rock radio formats, with program directors getting the chance of choosing the first single. The band's manager would tell Rolling Stone in 1994, the marketing plan for this band, such as it was, really was to have no marketing plan. We just wanted to let the record get out there and give people a chance to see the band and have the pleasure of discovering them on their own. Counting Crows would hit the road prior to the album coming out, opening for the likes of the Cranberries, Midnight Oil, Suede, and Cracker. Side note guys, I've done whole band histories on the Cranberries and Cracker, the links are down below. The state of Georgia would be instrumental in giving the band some early momentum. Radio stations WKLS or 96 Rock and WNNX in Atlanta, as well as Georgia State Radio Station WRAS were one of the first stations to play the track Mr. Jones in November of 1993. The success of the song in the Georgia radio market signaled to DGC that Mr. Jones was the logical first single to release, with the label issuing it as a promo single in December of 93. What's funny is that frontman Adam Duritz would reveal to Huffington Post that the label initially thought that Murder of One would be the big hit off the album, while the band members themselves thought Rain King would be a big single. In December of 93, the music video for Mr. Jones would be added to MTV's Buzzbin, which further propelled the song and the band's popularity. It was by January of 94 Counting Crows would appear on Saturday Night Live as the musical guest performing Mr. Jones and Round Here, and Duritz would reveal in multiple interviews that by the time Mr. Jones became a hit song, their debut album wasn't even in the top 200. It was the group's appearance on SNL that propelled the album to move 40 spots up the charts for six consecutive weeks, all the way to number two. The New York Times would report, and I have to admit this surprised me, that August and everything after would hit platinum status before Nirvana's Nevermind. Mr. Jones would end up peaking at number two on the US Top 40 charts by the spring of 94. The success of the song coincided with the death of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. Duritz would tell an interviewer about the impact of Cobain's death on him, revealing, we had heard that Kurt had shot himself and it really scared the hell out of me because I thought these things in my life were getting so out of control. Counting Crows seemed to be an anomaly to everything else that was popular at the time. Groups like Nirvana and Pearl Jam, whose music was abrasive and dealt with teen angst, had an audience that was mostly made up of people under the age of 25. Counting Crows, however, soon drew comparisons to the songwriters of the 60s and 70s, with the LA Times writing in their 1994 profile of the band, aside from that playfulness, the Crows music focuses on the lonely search for something or someone to believe in amid the confusion and contradictions of life, and the band sometimes captures that search with captivating warmth. As for who Mr. Jones is, Duritz would appear on Huffington Post Live and revealed Mr. 
Trevor Jones refers to his friend and former bandmate, bassist Marty Jones. Jones had played with Duritz in every one of his bands except Counting Crows. Jones' father would be one of the few Americans to make it as a flamenco guitar player in Spain, playing with a troupe. Both Adam and Marty would attend one of Jones's father's gigs in San Francisco, and the song tells the story of two struggling musicians, which were Duritz and Jones, who at the time were playing in a band called the Himalayans. Duritz would tell American songwriter, so we went over to San Francisco to the mission and we went to the show. Then afterwards, we were out drinking with the flamenco troupe. We ended up in a bar at one point late that night, and in the corner of the bar was Chris Isaac's drummer, Kenny Dale Johnson. At that point, Chris Isaac's band was the hottest rockabilly band in the city. He was sitting in the corner with three girls. I remember just talking about with Marty, saying, man, we've got to get our shit together and become rock stars. We couldn't even talk to girls. I remember I went home that night and I wrote the song. I don't really remember much about writing it, except that I wrote it in the middle of the night pretty drunk. In a separate interview with Huffington Post, Duritz would reveal that the song was really about himself, adding, I wrote a song about me, I just happened to be out with him that night, referring to Marty Jones. But it wasn't an easy process to get Mr. Jones finished. Duritz struggled to get anyone to play the song, whether it be his bandmates in the Himalayans, or the early version of Counting Crows, which was playing bars at this point in time. Duritz would recall to American songwriter, I remember bringing in Omaha and Mr. Jones, referring to the Himalayans, Lands, and we just couldn't get the feel of them together. Even when we finally taught it in Counting Crows for the band, it was hard for people to get either of those songs. They didn't really come together until we were in the studio recording the record. People didn't seem to grasp the grooves. It was full the success of Mr. Jones and the group's debut record, Duritz became known for being a tortured artist, and the group's follow-up record would deal with the pitfalls of superstardom. Recently, Duritz would appear on the Joe Rogan podcast and admit there was a lot of backlash against him and the band due to the success of Mr. Jones. The video garnered some negative responses on the subject of Duritz's appearance, making him more self-conscious going forward when it came time to do music videos or do press. That does it for today's video guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories.